Okay, Dr. Wilson Hume, if you'll uh, take us through the COVID-19 response and sure. mitigation plan, please. You bet. Um, so since we've talked about this, uh, we've had multiple uh, conversations. Uh, first of all, I'd like to introduce uh, Corey Smith. Corey's been leading patiently here tonight. Uh, Corey Smith is our district uh, registered nurse returning for a second year, so that's mm -hmm. Better than we did the year before, so it's awesome to have her back. I, there were times I wondered if she was going to survive Jason and Heath and me and all the stuff with COVID. But Corey's just done um, a remarkable job. That that job was significantly different last year than it had ever been. Uh, typically, you know, the nurses, um, our, our district nurse, um, really helps with the special education units and with the students with all those medical needs there. And then on occasion, two to three times a year, they get a call from um, from the superintendent or deputy superintendent or somebody in district leadership saying, hey, we have a case of uh, head lice, can you help out here, or bed bugs, can you consult? Um, but really, very little on like that side of things. So with, um, of course, going through the pandemic and keeping schools open in the pandemic, um, we utilize Corey a lot. Uh, she got to spend her Monday mornings with us and helping us make uh, really informed decisions. I just can't speak enough about how uh, valuable Corey's input has been. Uh, the other thing that's been super helpful with Corey is she's, I, I don't know how she does it, but she's continued to work part-time at the hospital, and so she's bringing that first-hand knowledge from her work there on what they're seeing in the hospital and how they're responding to things and uh, giving us a heads up if, if she's got concerns about things that are in our plan. So Corey, any, don't come up and say anything else you want to. <laughs> she's also, for those of you that have been in East Idaho education for uh, very long, she's a daughter of Roy Smith. Uh, that sadly we lost last year, but a uh, very well known coach. I mean, Ryrie Ry 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 and uh, Shelly, and a uh, very, very well respected and known coach for a lot of years in East Idaho. So, principal. Yeah, she was the principal of Ryrie. So, Corey can answer any questions as well. Is there anything else you want to say, Corey, at all, or just hi? <laughs> <laughs> Which hospital do you work at? I work at Ermac. Yeah, right. So, what are you seeing? What am I what? What are you seeing there, Corey, as far as Well, we've had an cases. increase of amount. An increase in numbers. In numbers, yes. From? Then we have we had earlier. For the last, yeah. For the last few months. Okay. And if you're okay, I think Corey told us that they're also seeing a younger, um, a younger population. They're not down in the school age yet, but certainly younger than we saw last year. Yes, that's what they're telling us. With any of those, have you seen increase in like respirator use or anything like that? I know our intensive care units have been full, but it's also like it's trauma season. Yeah. So. Just curious. Yeah. <laughs> it's hard to say because I don't work in the intensive care units, so I'm not involved in that care. Thank you. Can I just add something? Yeah. We are so fortunate to have her. I don't know how many lives she saved. Thank you. She works in on as an oncology nurse, and she was the go-to for the oncologists. We are just so fortunate. To yeah, have yeah, we're really, really fortunate. So, thank you, Corey. Thank yeah, you for just a minute, just to get other questions. I know you can sit out, but okay. if there's no questions, come up. You're ready to jump up. So, um, in addition uh, to talking through things with Corey, which has been very helpful. Um, I also had a couple of conversations with uh, East Idaho Public Health, and just like we talked about last year, you know, um, they they were not um, they didn't criticize our plan, um, but officially, you know, they they need to toe the line as far as what the CDC's recommendations are. But they also understand uh, that as a district, we've got to make recommendations that we feel are going to help us operate and keep our schools running in a, in a manner that doesn't substantially interfere with education. So I felt good with those conversations with public health. I've also had um, several offline conversations with other area superintendents and so had a chance to look at uh, plans from other school districts and then probably really critically just had a chance to go through the plan with our principals and discuss any questions or concerns that they've had. And then following um, our opening meeting with principals, which would have been not this Monday, but the Monday before, we sent it out to um, our families and to our staff. So uh, when we sent out the plan, um, really what I sent out was a welcome back letter to our families 
and also to our staff. And in that letter, <clears throat> the, the key thing I focused on was the opening plan, and I included basically a one-page synopsis of the plan in that letter with a link to the full plan. So, and then from the full plan, they had the opportunity to respond to a survey. So we really, compared to last year, uh, we had an incredibly low number of people that responded to the survey, which you know, we can make our own inferences about that, but to me, I take that as a sign that people really aren't so concerned that they felt like they had to provide that feedback. So um, again, over 5,000 people uh, read the letter, and then I don't remember, I think I said more than email, about 400 um, clicks on the link to the plan, and then we had just over 100 responses to the actual survey. So. Uh, with that, um, based on the survey results we did get back, um, you can see that um, on a scale of a negative 10 to a positive 10, we had a score of eight and a half for both staff and families on how they feel about kids coming back to school in the fall, which is uh, great. Definitely not the level of a concern or anxiety that we saw last year. Um, and then um, just the overall level of support for the plan, and you can see high levels of support, 100% from uh, families either supporting or strongly supporting, and 92% from our staff. And then um, breaking that down to each phase, again, we have the green phase, which is really basically continuing school the way that we finished school last year, and then going up to, into a yellow phase, which we start to see an increased number of active cases inside the school district, and then to a red phase if uh, we see a significant number of uh, cases in the school. So. Uh, from our staff, um, a six, again, between a negative 10 and a positive 10, a 6.7 on the green phase, a 5.4 on the yellow, and then dropping down to 4.7 on the red phase, which just basically indicates that they supported it, but not strongly. And then on the families, um, six for the green phase, one uh, for the yellow, and a 0.3. So nothing in the um, opposed range, uh, but definitely waning support once you get up into the red phase, which is not a surprise where we start talking about bringing back um, mask mandates and um, quarantines for students, which were not super popular strategies last year. Um, but nonetheless, those are, I think it's important to note that those are key strategies recommended by the CDC. And I'm comfortable, personally, a superintendent, I'm comfortable not taking those recommendations to a point. Uh, but I do feel like there's this level of responsibility that if we completely turn a blind eye to those and we're being somewhat reckless in our. Um, on decision making to say we're going to completely ignore uh, public health guidelines no matter how bad it gets here. So that's that's my rationale and why we would include those in the red phase, but that's certainly open to discussion among the board tonight. So, um, and then level of concern for coming back to school, and 60% uh, had no concerns, 35% had some concerns. Uh, that's among families with their kids coming back to school. I didn't include the staff one, but the staff one is very similar to that. So, but again, not a not a high number, but statistically speaking, that's one nice thing with statistics is theoretically you can make inferences, and that should be fairly reflective of what the overall population thinks. So, with that, um, I read through the comments that were submitted as well, and, I, and in those comments, again, we see the polarity of the issue. Um, with some people feeling like we're being overly lenient, some people feel like uh, no matter what, we shouldn't have masks or quarantine students. Uh, again, my hopes and prayers are that we never hit that red phase so that those don't have to become issues, but as I spoke, I do think if things get bad enough, those are things we have to consider bringing back. So uh, with that, I think I'd recommend that we approve the plan as the board um, saw it when we sent it out for public input. Maybe the one caveat to that is we've had um, there's one or two comments uh, from families wondering why, and I think even from teachers maybe, why we wouldn't notify about a possible exposure at school in the green phase. So I'll just start by answering that question. The reason why is that took, that took a significant amount of uh, manpower for us to do last year. It impacted um, teachers. They had to spend time doing it. It impacted principals, secretaries. It impacted us at the district office. It, it's not an easy task uh, to do those notifications, and that's why uh, we pushed it back. Uh, we are bringing in a program this year that allows teachers to um, text, email, and call parents directly from their school computer. So, or at least tentatively thinking that they could notify simply that there's a, that there's a positive case in their classroom and give them that much of a notification. It's not going to the extent of your student was in close contact like we did last year. Uh, maybe just that notification that you're just 
just so you know, a student, one of your students' classes um, did test positive, and you may want to be a little extra vigilant. But I guess the other reason why we didn't put it in is we really didn't see a lot of transmission last year in schools. Um, the reason why I would consider it is because we don't know with new variants if we're going to see higher transmission among school age kids. So just still doing with a whole lot of unknowns with this. So that, that may be one part that we actually put in, but I think for now the safe thing to do is say we wouldn't start that until the yellow phase, and that way if we start it, I don't think anybody's going to be too upset, but if we say we're going to do it and we don't, then we've got an issue on our hands. So, so questions from the board? Uh, Dr. Wilson, you, you mentioned CDC. What about our Southeast Idaho Health and Welfare Agency locally? Yeah. Are, uh, do we, are we, I mean, we're not passing by them, are they going to provide the we list? Yeah, so. Where do they stand? I mean, what, yeah, so our local, this? our local health board is East Idaho Public Health. Um, they, I spoke with uh, James Corbett, um, who functions as their epidemiologist, and I also spoke with Jerry Racco, who's the director. Um, their indication is that this time their board is not considering bringing back a plan like they had last year, okay. and they are here to consult and to help us and to provide advice, um, but at this time they're not considering bringing back any rules or mandates, so we're really on our own. Okay. I have heard rumors of something happening at the state level. Um, maybe I should just shut up there. I'm just going to say we're starting school in two weeks. I mean, the, the state was going to do something, they should have done it two months ago, not now. So that it's not helpful to get a plan from the state the week that school starts or two weeks before school starts. So uh, my preference is they just let us keep rolling like we've done. But Some like, districts are starting next week. Yeah. So well, I guess we'll deal with that if, it, if and when it comes out. Um, and I'm not quite sure. I just heard that last week when we were in Boise, but I haven't seen any official communication about it. Yeah, in fairness, there's obviously a lot happening in the last few weeks. Yeah. And None of us can control the circumstances. And we're all victims to a certain extent, right? But um, but I get it. Yeah, administratively, it's really hard to yeah to get guidance two days before you open school, for example. That's really difficult to to communicate and deal with. But um, so so following up on Chad's comment or question, <coughs> East Idaho Public Health. I mean, they're there is to consult with, give us feedback, et cetera, which we've done, but they're they're not making any recommendations other than follow CDC guidance. Is, is that a fair summary? Yeah, yeah. Again, and it's a lot like our relationship, right? So you have a, we have a board uh, that is the official entity that makes decisions, and then you have administrators that function like I do. So my cons my discussions have been with them, and their indication is that their board has not shown any interest in developing a plan. But but Jerry and James are are very much there to support us and help us if we have questions. Uh, but officially, you know, they they would never give us a recommendation to not follow CDC guidance. So their board consisted of the, of the county commissioner, uh, physician. Uh, yeah, and that's it. So they have one county commissioner from each of the seven counties they serve, plus a physician. And so that board is really not functioning. Well, as well, they do. They 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 okay. they do their normal stuff. They're just not interested in bringing back a plan like they had okay. last year. Okay, I get it. Okay. Could you? Uh, Scott, talk a little bit more about the Mondays. <coughs> yeah. Secondary yeah. and uh, high schools and then the elementary level. Sure. Yeah, I appreciate that, Chad. So in the plan, uh, we did have a page devoted to uh, learning and instruction. Wanted to make sure that there was a place that people could reference what the plan is for Mondays. And so the plan is um, superficially <laughs> the same as last year where our Mondays uh, for secondary We'll have uh, students in the building from 8.40 till um, 12.40, and we'll be feeding them lunch. The difference, um, so just sticking with middle schools and high schools, the key difference um, in our communication compared to last year, and there have been a very small number, a couple of uh, people have expressed concern about it, 
is that um, last year we essentially said you can stay home unless unless your teacher says you need to be at school. We're flipping that to say you need to be at school unless your teacher excuses you. Right. Um, and I know for all of our schools, these first couple weeks in September, the expectation is students will be there on Mondays. Uh, we really need to get school up and rolling and get things going. And then once we start to see um, you know, the students who need extra help and intervention, then we can start dedicating that time to support those students. So will they be in, in classes? Yeah, so the expectation is that we'll run some type of bell schedule. I think it's going to look a little bit different at different high schools. I know Hillcrest is going to implement uh, a mentoring program that's going to take some of that time. So their periods will be likely shorter than the other two high schools. Uh, for our instructional hours, we need kids there for three and a half hours on those, on those Mondays. Uh, but with this program that I just talked about, with teachers being able to notify parents through text and email as well as phone calls, um, then teachers can notify parents on Friday and say, your student's doing great, they don't need to come on Monday, here's some at-home learning that they can do instead if they choose to. Okay. Um, and then the elementaries, again, a little bit of a shift probably from the messaging last year. Elementaries, um, they'll just have the first and the third Mondays and the fifth Mondays with no school, and that also means there's no expectation that those students have to do online learning at home. Uh, because we've met their instructional hours with that every other Monday uh, schedule. The one exception we have to have, uh, due to a really quirky state law, we do have to have kindergarten students do a little bit of reading at home with their parents to meet our minimum instructional hours. So that's the, the overall plan. Again, the key thing is um, students need to be there unless their teachers have excused them. And, and maybe this wasn't the primary determinant of that. It was really trying to make sure we have kids there because last year we needed kids there that didn't come, and so we've got to do, we need to do a better job of uh, some accountability to get kids there that really need to. But also, uh, the state is shifting back to an attendance-based funding formula, and we've got to be stricter on enforcing what attendance looks like on Mondays this year compared to last year. Thank you. Are there any other questions from the board? Just the document goes from you. I think that one. Okay, go ahead. Um, Great. Non immune students remind me how we're making that determination. Yeah, so this was where, again, East Idaho Public Health was very helpful. So uh, there are several ways that students could uh, demonstrate that they have immunity. And again, we don't have to worry about that until we get into really the red phase of the plan where students would be quarantined. But uh, students could have immunity to COVID from um, either re receiving a vaccine, having been um, infected with uh, or tested positive for, the, um, for COVID, or having an antigen test that shows that they have antibodies. So if they, if they never had an actual positive test, um, then, but they go and get an antigen test that shows they have antibodies, then that would just qualify as immunity. So really, it's the same thing we did last year. Um, the only difference is we now have a vaccine that's available for students that wasn't there last year. So there's one more way that students could have immunity. And so we're not, we're not asking anything about that or getting in the middle of that unless it gets into red status? Or red. Right, and even then I don't anticipate us getting in the middle of it. What I anticipate happening is um, if we do get to red and we say these students need to quarantine unless they have immunity, then parents could voluntarily say, yep, our students received the vaccine on these dates, Here's, yep. and then we just put a flag in power school. It's really the same thing we did last year, but last year all we could base it on were again, positive tests or antigen tests, okay. and now we could also do it off of the vaccine. This plan does encourage uh, vaccination of our students. And staff. And staff, yes. Yep, and again, just want to, I guess, really underscore that we still think that's very fundamentally a personal choice and people need to make their own decisions. Um, but I we really saw the impact, the benefit of the vaccines last year with our staff, and I, I feel like it's um, it's a key step definitely for our staff to take, keep our schools open. Um, and then I would say, I'll just say personally, I think it would be very beneficial for our kids to, to do that, but that's still very much be their choice. I assume you saw the publication about the promotion of the 
quarantine physicians that signed the letter here locally, I think it was yesterday or whatever. Did that reaction there? Uh, actually, I didn't see it. Oh. It didn't. It didn't come to me. Okay. Um, I, my, we were contacted by a news agency that said it, um, okay. a neighboring district had received it, but I have not received it. Okay. It, 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 so let me tell you what I think I know, and then. And yeah. Corey, did you see that? Okay, so Corey will be able to okay. provide some helpful feedback. So go ahead. I don't need to say anything. Well, no. I mean, I'd be interested. I mean, I can give you my quick summary, but you probably understand it better than me. I'm just interested in. The administration's yeah. kind of reaction to it. That kind of, so you want to speak to it? Do you, know, you have a give a poor you, attempt? You go summary? ahead. <laughs> you can give a okay. summary. But from what I understand, uh, there are 14 local physicians, um, meaning roughly Idaho Falls to Blackfoot, who signed a letter and sent it to, I believe, District 91, saying that they strongly encourage the board of District 91 to re make mass mandatory in elementary schools. I think that's the correct summary. Um, yes. And I'm not endorsing that, I'm just interested in, in people who know a lot more about this stuff than me reacting to it. And I guess. Uh, I'll, 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 yeah, no, I'll, just, okay. I'll just give you my initial reaction to that. So number one, always appreciate feedback from our doctors. Um, I'll say I, I still believe the right place to take those is to our public health board. Yeah. That's that's their responsibility, and ask the public health board to encourage or require masks in schools. That's that's their expertise. I'm an educator. Yeah. I'm an English teacher. Yeah. I, that's not my level of expertise. And so, <laughs> and so, but but from the start, I think that well, that's debatable. But what I would say is, in our plan, we clearly state, and I, I still believe as a public school district, this is the right answer, we will listen to public health guidance. And so as soon as our doctors, medical yeah. professionals, will convince our public health board to tell us something different, I we will listen to that. It's the same thing we did last year. We yeah. stuck to our guns and we listened to our public health. But 14 physicians, we <coughs> have 14 other physicians come in and say exactly the opposite. I don't think we can get into that situation. Maybe one of those 14 could volunteer to fill the empty spot on the... That uh, would be helpful. So I'm not trying health. to discount their professional knowledge. I'm just saying as a school district, we need to listen to public health yeah. when we make those decisions. Yeah. So, Corey, is there anything else you want to... I just think that we need to look at our own data as well. I mean, because this is like county-wide. It's not just our group. And so I think the plan that we have is very, it's reasonable, it's not too strict, it's not too lenient, it's showing exactly what we have had experienced in our district. Yeah. Parents can mask their kids if they choose. If they want to homeschool them, they can choose. It's still up to the parents, but I feel like we need to have our kids' physical health and their mental health. And I think we are taking the mental health out of this picture by just putting masks on it. Yeah. And, and so I think we just need to stay the course and tell our numbers, show us right. differently, or public health says, hey, you guys need to do yeah. it. And that's the key is really our plan is based on what we saw last year. Um, I would just say I, I don't believe that masks made a difference last year. I'm not saying they wouldn't necessarily make a difference this year if, again, we start to see that, that school transmission, but we just didn't see it last year. So new variants, just like Corey said, could change our data and that could change our decisions, but we're making the best decision based on what we learned last year. And on Public Health's website, they have variants listed. They uh, that, That's what's been tested. And there's only four Delta variants, like the variant that everybody's concerned about, there's only four in those counties listed. We're still in the original ones. Okay. And so until that data gets a little bit better, I think instead of jumping the gun, we just be patient and kind of see. And then if we start seeing an uptick, then we deal with it. Yeah. That's helpful. Thanks, Corey. That is helpful. <coughs> Thanks, Corey. Any other comments from the board? Okay, I will now entertain a motion regarding the response and mitigation plan from the report by the district. I move that we approve the plan as presented. Second. Okay, it's been moved by Mr. Calder, seconded by 
Mr. Jenkins, that we approve the district's COVID-19 response mitigation plan. All in favor, say aye. I can. Just dis discussion. Oh, discussion, yes. Sorry. I appreciate Sorry. everybody no, I'm just thinking. I just appreciate everybody being here and for the input. Um, I sent Dr. Shackley an email earlier today. It's been the Wolf's Air Wolf's I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Um, Coach Shackley, his son was out of my house today. <laughs> so I was talking to him today. So he was just, anyway, working in my house. But I just, uh, I want to say the last 30 days have been tough um, for me. And I don't know if a lot of the other board members have had a lot of emails and stuff, but I've had nurses and doctors call me, and I know we, we've, we've seen that, uh, the group of doctors that uh, put out their statement, but I probably had about 15 or 20 talk to me and tell me the opposite. And I guess one of the, st the sticking points for me is I've talked to a lot of people, I've talked to doctors and nurses and patrons and even teachers and kids, and um, they all just reject this idea of mass mandates and forcing kids to do things. And I've had a lot of doctors share information on it how there hasn't been a lot of, hardly any money spent on studies on how they're effective. And all, even the government, <coughs> the federal website, they haven't spent $1 of their health budget to actually invest in these kids and figure out if these masks are working. In fact, the only test we have is that they're not. And so I, I don't, I don't want, I know it's a touchy subject and I know a lot of people, are, you know, it could go either way. Um, but I guess that's my sticking point. I just wanted to let everybody know before we vote that I, I can't support a mask mandate. I'm not going to force kids to wear masks. I think that uh, parents should have that freedom to choose. And, you know, medical decisions and med privacy of their medical history, that's always been their right. And so, you know, I just want to put that before the board, before we vote, that I just strongly feel that way. And as long as there's a mask mandate in there, I just, I'm not going to force people to, to do that. So. I just wanted to let people know where that is, where I stand. And I've had a lot of correspondence, a lot of emails in patrons in, in my area and outside of my area that, they, that have expressed that, that they just, this whole idea of forcing our kids to wear these masks is, is not, they don't feel it's right. So, anyway. So, thanks, Scott. They have, yeah. Mm -hmm. the, the plan does not include a mask mandate. Unless it's mm -hmm. in it does if it gets to the states. states. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. Okay, so uh, thanks Scott. We yeah. do have a motion on the table and a second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. And, and, and one nay. So uh, the motion passes. <laughs>